necessarily align with mine. <laughs> I, that's why I asked you for yours. That's the weirdest thing. It, like, I don't want to give it to you. You don't want to. I don't want to give you my opinion. No. Uh, that's know. you know. In retrospect, if you disagree with me, it's unpleasant for me. Well. J.C. Mellencamp said it best when he said that his opinions mean nuts. That's what I think. So I think this would be one of those times. <laughs> that's when the walls came crumbling down. That's oh. uh, that's when that fine. At Tanagra? J.C. Mellencamp. That's a deep cut. Welcome to the Backpack Show, everybody, where we bring you insights into success from unusual places, as in not the same people you hear from on lots and lots of business shows, people you've possibly never met before but need to. Listen, if you're here for the very first time, you've got to say hi in the comment section, or I don't know you're here. I had a this whole last weekend, I got all these people replying to my email newsletter saying, I love the backpack show. I was like, I've never seen you there once. And I was just like, leave a goddamn comment. Just hi. You just hey, type hi and hit enter. Just leave a comment. Uh, yeah. Works out great. Who do we have today? We have some guests, I think. We do. Everett Cruz, who grew up in Sweden and was a competitive tennis player, still is, uh, on the European circuit. He's now in America. He's the CEO for Tencent USA, an apparel brand. So we're going to talk with him about helping uh, people, sometimes like myself, who are bad at tennis, to become very, very good at tennis. And also how his sports and athletic skills translate into running a big company like Tencent USA. And we're going to talk to Judy Kroon, who's Canada's keynote humorist. So all our Canadians will be very, very successful about that. Very, very happy With about it. With a name like Croon, you would have thought she'd been a singer. No, all of, I'm thinking of all our Canadian guests who always are very excited whenever we have anybody from Canada. Like, they come out in force. So I have seen some of our Canadian guests lately, though, so maybe they're not around. But lovely mother, my mother, is here to make up the difference. In the same. Hi, everyone. Tim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz welcoming you to The Backpack Show. Your hosts, Chris Brogan, Kerry Gargone. Boom shakalaka. Backpack show. I am I'm, not Rob. <laughs> I'm so bad at tennis. I, I grew up in this little town on Cape Cod and I made the tennis team, like junior varsity tennis team, because there was like literally no one else. And uh, I was not good at it. I had my sister's Brady Bunch tennis racket and uh, it wasn't good. It wasn't a great experience. I ended up doing cross country instead, lettered in that because I could do it by myself. <laughs> so why? Oh, you're so interesting. Oh, shut you up. Found a way to letter for yourself. All right. By you myself. There's a difference. <laughs> something, something details. Uh, all right. Listen, we have some we have some sponsors that do this show, and I'm gonna handle their ads up front for the first time this month. All right, ready? You <laughs> can make a show just like this one. You gotta, you know, do the work though. This isn't, you know. This is not easy making a show like this. It's just easy running a show like this because you just go to cbrogan.me slash streamyard and this thing runs itself. You just push a few buttons, click a few mouse clicks, you're done. You got a show, baby. I mean, ideally with some other people with ideas yeah. that you can share. Bring your own uh, Canadian tennis pro humorous, and tennis pro. Hey, listen, authors, have you written a book? Well, you think you're out of the woods. You haven't even started yet. You've got to promote that book. So you should make a website. Well, you can go and learn how to make a website. That sounds like a fun several weeks. Or you could just make one in a couple hours at PubSite, pub-site.com. It's designed specifically for authors like you who don't really want to learn how to make websites. That's right. 14-day <laughs> free trial. So you can kick around and pretend you know what you're doing for 14 days. Let's all be honest. You're not going to do anything till the 13th day anyway. So then you go, oh, crap. What am I going to do? And That's then you can, <laughs> everything. You can have them make the website for you. So listen to this. After your 13 and a half free day trial comes out, there's a little button on pub-site.com that says make it for me and it's only 499 us dollars now listen if you want me to do it for you i'll cut you in on a deal it's only two thousand dollars and all i'll really do is just give them 499 and keep Stop it, it. pub-site.com i promise you can do it yourself right. it'll take you like no time look at do you like sausage who doesn't want some johnsonville brats <laughs> we'll send you some carry at chrisberger.com because johnsonville sponsors this show for no great reason uh because not, you love them is why i love them so much yeah. hi leslie how are you we're off to a punchy start today. We really are. Maybe All it's just right. because you discovered something I'm terrible at, tennis. <laughs> tennis. Yeah, it's the first of the first of several cracks in the armor. We thought you were a tennis wizard. So Ever Cruz is a tennis wizard from Sweden, the only nation I've ever visited that pointed their guns at me. 
So Sweden is a beautiful place. He's, he's now in the land of Canada. He did, me and Christopher Penn um, in 2007. Now Everett is in the States and has been. He, he, he was smart enough to leave Sweden and go right to California, which is basically our know. Sweden. I don't know if that's true. We'll have to find out. Well, let's drag him in. Let's ask him some questions. Okay. Did you go straight to California or did you stop somewhere dumb like Michigan? Mm. <laughs> no, nah, it, 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 nah, it was Hawaii. <gasps> oh, pardon us. Hawaii. And you kept going after that because I might have been like, this is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, no, it turned out to be Hawaii first and then I end up in LA. Um, so, you, you know, you have this big history before this. You, you Before running a, a, a very famous Swedish clothing company, which is also now worldwide and renowned at it, uh, you were kind of doing a little bit of your own fame and fortune, doing some, some uh, world stage level athletics in, in tennis. When did this all start? Were you, were you a five-year-old with a racket or like how did this get going? Uh, I mean, pretty much. I mean, you know, you start in a very, very early age, probably seven or eight. And um, I played through those years into a junior and became very competitive. And, um, you know, I mean, spent most of my hours, you know, after school in, in tennis training and um, on, on weekends playing matches and tournaments. And um, that was pretty much the, the way I grew up. So that's where my parents went wrong then. Obviously, I could have been <laughs> prodigy. They just didn't nurture me properly. It's, yeah. um, it's a it's a good year to start something and then you learn and you most of the time you uh I would say kids they succeed pretty good in it. But they start early. Ever I oh, hate to subject games, you right? <laughs> hand eye I, coordination. I hate <laughs> to subject you to this, Everett, but when is Sean Connery's favorite sport? Oh God! When is when? Sean Connery's favorite sport? Tennis. <laughs> yeah, tennis. So right. Rob Hatch reminded me of that joke. I had totally forgotten, but that's what you get. <laughs> oh, yeah. I meant to mention I, I got a Savannah Banana shirt. Oh, look at you! Yeah. That's our that's our uh, co collegiate summer uh, softball t uh, baseball team. Baseball. Sorry. The Savannah Bananas uh, in Savannah, Georgia. So an athletic company like yourself. Right. Um, but the now, reason I thought of it was because if, if I could play tennis the way that they do baseball, like I could maybe do it. They do like they run like a circus and then a baseball game breaks out. So I was like, I could be part of the tennis circus when you get that going. Ever. Well, yeah. so that's a question. Tennis is a right. tennis is a sport that has been largely unchanged as far as rules go yes. for a long, long, long time. But the technology has changed and what's considered good sportsmanship has changed over the years. And a lot has changed. Do you see, I mean, you love tennis. That's the, you run the yes. Santa Monica tennis association. Like you can't, but do you see tennis as vibrant and still changing and still has lots to give as entertainment goes? And as far as that sort of world or, or how do you see it? No, I mean, I think there's d different opinions about it, how people want tennis to be in the future. And I think I belong to one of those that I would like to see a little bit more, um, what we have talked about for years now, a little bit more on-court coaching, like how they do in other sports where you can actually stop, the coach goes in and he talks and they go through a strategy and and I think that can create a little bit more excitement and a little bit more strategy for the watchers. Um, and I think because I think, you know, sometimes when I talk to people and I ask them, like, why they if they don't watch tennis, they don't really understand. And then say, like, between everything, it's always quiet. <laughs> There's nothing going on except watching that ball. And I kind of understand that because if you don't know everything about tennis, then that makes a little harder to you know get catched into it i would say that see that's why you need the circus everett yeah. like, <laughs> circus sometimes with short attention it. spans over to watch like juggling yeah you play tennis yeah. say hi to linda over at youtube by the way i don't think we've seen linda around just lately so good to see you linda hi how are you um one reason Carrie wanted to bring you onto the show, though, is that so after a very successful career in tennis and after running on your own time, the Santa Monica Tennis uh, Academy, I keep wanting to call it association and I'm making <laughs> English is my first language. An academy and I'm to go there to learn. So, <laughs> But you run uh, Tents in USA, 
which is a brand uh, that started in the 1950s in Sweden. Uh -huh. uh, Paul Ryland, is that his name? Yes. Yes. So he has his own sort of history and legacy before starting this thing. What does Tencent mean to, to Swedes? And then talk about it as sort of being an international brand at this point. Well, I think um, I, I remember Tencent as a little kid in Sweden. I think there was in the in the seventies and maybe early eighties where, you know, every kid or teenager, you know, they had to wear his jacket, the Tencent jacket. So it was a big fashion part in Sweden. And I also it's you know when something gets popular in Sweden, it's like everybody wears the same thing for you know the that year or two years, and that's why I remember everybody wanted his jacket, and he did a lot of. He succeeded, and I also think in other countries that I became really big in his fashionable um, beachwear and some right. other stuff. Yeah, and um, and that was kind of I think how I remember Tencent until it was maybe five years ago up here in LA, and uh, we you know I'm skiing a lot and put a lot of uh, time into skiing, and I saw it somewhere, and I can't remember where I saw it, but I saw it the name. And I said to myself, I know this brand and I've seen this uh, name before, but I couldn't put my own and try to figure out from where. But then, you know, it's like, oh, I remember this is in Sweden and um, contacted the guy, see if um, how they were doing here in the U.S. And then, you know, we became friends and then we took it from there. <laughs> and they were like, be our CEO. And you were like, OK. <laughs> hey, come run the company. We don't know. <laughs> that was, it was all over. No, it was more like, you know, Tencent was very, um, you know, they're very strong in Europe and has been around there the whole time. And they're very strong in the ski community in Europe. And here in the U.S., you know, we have, as we know, we have so many brands and so many different styles of, of, um, of just one sport that, it, you know, it's hard to kind of get into that market. But because... You know, I had such a love for the brand and I um, thought, really thought it was something different than just one of those big um, giant brands. And I thought this could be something good to have here in the U.S. and people like it. And um, and at the time, then I got a couple sets of clothing that I bought from them. And every time I went skiing, people kept asking me, like, where did you get this from? Oh, this looks nice. It looks like it's from somewhere else. So I kind of right. got the idea, like, well... Maybe, you know, we can start something here in the U.S. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, if you play tennis competitively your whole life, you're going to look better in a ski jacket than like the average person. <laughs> so they could be like, where can I get that ski jacket? Then they put it on. They're like, why don't I look like Everett? I don't understand. But so yeah. these are all very functional, like perform. This is performance clothing, but a lot yes. of people do wear it just for style. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the, the whole industry today has gone into where – even a company as Tenson, they they were such a they make such a functional wear that you can wear it. For example, like us, we're standing on the tennis court, you know, many hours through the year, and we you know stand in cold weather and sometimes middle of the day. Especially here in California, we can have what we call warm weather during uh, middle of the day, and then towards later on, late um, afternoon, it gets cold and. We have those, what we call those very thin puffy jackets that we put on. And they, I mean, and they're just perfect. They're not too cold, not too hot. And you can move in them free. And it's just like, oh, nice. What that's, stuff, um, have you brought over from playing competitive tennis to running a business? Like playing in the French Open obviously requires a certain amount of competitive focus yeah. and other things. So what have you yeah, learned? I think it's just, you know, as an athlete, what you learn is like you never give up. We, you know, I mean, I keep telling people, you know, trying to be a pro in tennis and, and every day you go spend four or five, six hours of training and then a year goes by, but you're talking about you're spending four or five, six years of doing this. And it's like, well, I don't know anything else except just keep on trying. And if it's something you like and you have a love for, I always feel like one way or another you succeed. And what it is, I don't know, but you will do it and you will make it. So... In your moving this brand uh, from being a famous Swedish brand to being a U.S. brand and a worldwide brand, like mm. one thing you said is, you know, for instance, action sports brands in California are huge. I, I addressed the Action Sports Network way back in 2010 or so, and it was 160 different uh, brands yeah. that you would know, like um, yeah. 
uh, Hurley and Oakley. It was at Oakley's headquarters and, you know, all those brands in the OC area. Yeah. Uh, so we want, it's a massively competitive market just in California. Not, yeah. You don't even have to leave the state for it to be crazy. Yeah. Uh, do you just sort of wing it? Do you just say, okay, I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens? Or, or is there a magic in how you made the brand stand out in any way? Or what did you, what did you have to have happen there? And how did you put that off? Well, I think uh, pretty much what we think is we, we just took the risk of saying, because every time I was wearing the clothing and anything I did, if it was in skiing or if it was on the tennis court, or we also, you know, have jackets, you know, walk around in the evening when it's cold. And um, there was always comments about it. Like we, we would have people coming up and asking. And then I thought, well, I mean, let's try. I mean, this is, if there is a, if people comes up and ask for something, that means like, I feel like people can see it. And, um, you know, I think this makes it a different. And then we, just decided let's try for it and see what happens. And uh, we started a little bit over a year ago. And I guess it wasn't the best year to get started on. <laughs> but, you know, we had some success and uh, locally we're doing well and people, you know, still coming up to us and asking when we are out. And uh, so I think it, like the excitement of it is like what we, what's going to happen in the future because it's so far, we feel like everything that's coming back has been very positive. So, um, yeah, we see. <laughs> we will, we will, we will. Uh, what is the experience like? I'm going back to sports for a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the experience like in uh, playing at that world level? And is it, you know, what's the time like in between the matches? And then what's it like when you finally have to go there and put your brain in the match for a, a bit? Well, it's it's a, it feels like forever. I mean, every time you step onto a court and you're battling if it's a, it's a match or just a, even if it's a just practice and you want to, as an athlete, when you step in, I would say to perform, you always do that to do your best. And if you can't perform the best, then that happens sometimes. It's, um, you know, I mean, it can be a very frustrated. It's um, And it feels like, I feel like every second feels like, we call it minutes or hours and um it is challenging because you you know you give up thousand times and you start thousand times and you know that's what we learn like but you never give up because you always believe in it so saying someone like me who never made anything big in that perspective of tennis but i became a very um known um, training partner and hitting partner to some of the famous tennis players and um and i said you know no next year is my year <laughs> and that was after 10 years i kept saying next year is going to be my year <laughs> but then you know but then actually at the end i did what was discovered was it wasn't maybe just just be you know a better tennis player but this was my love for the sport and the drive i have that kept me going so and i think it, that's what it brought me back into tense and i said i see there is a potential here and it's you know if we have a good brand it's a good quality i know we can do it and it's um and i think that's where it all started if we could pop back to the tennis academy for a minute when did you decide to help other people who maybe had a love of tennis but could use some help <laughs> with the technical side like yes. myself he <laughs> <laughs> came from well I would start to understanding when I was playing and, um, you know, wanted to turn pro and, um, you know, it didn't really get there in that, in that level that everybody needs help and everybody needs a support. If it was a mental support or physical support and um, um, advices and, and um, encouragement, I felt like it was something I was really good at because I needed all this stuff. And, um, and I thought to myself at a certain point where if I couldn't succeed in this and to become a good player, maybe I could help someone else to do something that I wanted to do, but actually have that luck to get someone to help them and push them. And um, when I started it here at 2000, I, it was the first time I started training, I call it the, the general public, it, people that haven't held a tennis racket in the hand ever, or, you know, as a little kid that grew up hitting against a wall or 
took a couple of lessons in the park here and there. And I had to explain like kind of like what's the front and the rear of a racket and how to hold it. That was a completely different challenge to me. But and that took a whole learning experience of uh, patient and uh, understanding and how you can then show another person how even if you start at a later age, you there's never a uh, point where you cannot succeed or reach your goals. Oh, I'm sure there's been times when you're like, how about you try swimming? Just an <laughs> idea. We're in Santa Monica. <laughs> yeah. You have to occasionally guide a few people off the court, I guess. You know? uh, sometimes. Like me. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, Evercruz, stick around if you can. Thank you so uh -huh. much for the Thank conversation. You. It's been so good. We're going to grab our friend, Judy Kroon, our brand new friend, just met her, uh, Judy Kroon. We're going to talk about comedy and the, the importance of laughter. So don't go anywhere. There's no ads. It's right now. Hi, Judy. <laughs> hey. How you guys doing? Best Great. Day ever today. Stuck around for you. Awesome. Good. Um, so relieving work-related stress. How's that going? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's it's stressful for a lot of folks out there right now with uh, with COVID, obviously, and everything that that involves. Whether it's you know uh, having to deal with the kids at home and uh, or dealing with with losing your job, um, but at the same time too, I always say to people, uh, you know humor is very closely related to fear in our brain and when we face the unknown uh we lean on humor so i'll give you a couple of really simple examples but uh even in the most stressful times so when the cavemen and the cave women were in the caves and they heard a noise outside they'd freak out and they think it was some horrible giant monster that was coming to get them and then a little animal jumped by and they laughed and as I said, humor is just part of our brain when we are facing the unknown. We lean on humor. So um, when I was uh, working at the radio station here in Toronto a number of years ago, we did a radiothon every year for uh, Sick Kids Hospital. And I remember chatting with these parents who said, you know, um, when our little boy was going through chemotherapy, uh, we were really, really afraid. And uh, we're not typically very funny people, but we started leaning on on humor and pretty dark humor at times. But thank goodness now our son is in remission and we kind of look back at what got us through those those times. And we realize that, you know, our humor, our, our very dark humor at times got us through. When we are facing the unknown, we lean on, uh, we lean on that, we need it. You know, so, uh, so yeah, it is a stressful time. It's a scary time, but we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it together. And at the very, you know, at the very least, don't go into the stress mode. I always say when we laugh, we relax. When we relax, we learn. Judy, there's so much going on. And it, timing wise, it's interesting. We talked to a young lady yesterday who had uh, very bad chronic illnesses, oh. uh, Lauren Henderson Starkweather, and she did something similar. One of the things she used was humor and, and comedy uh, to help people through it and also to help herself through it. And of course, always dark humor. And when we said to her something about, so tell us a little bit about humor, she goes, well, uh, my beloved dog of 14 years died just last week. Oh. And that was the first sentence. And we oh. thought, that's not oh, comedy. No. That's not <laughs> comedy. Where are the jokes? Where are the jokey jokes? <laughs> we got this wrong. And I have to say, she got us there to the point we were crying. We were laughing so hard mm -hmm. because it's sort of part of her shtick. Her shtick is kind of like, you know, bumbling through life in these ways. And the fact that when you someone says to her, tell us about comedy, she talks about a dead dog is who she is. So you mentioned in some of your training about uh, trying to figure out what your hook is and all that sort of thing. And being and doing radio humor is different than doing a stage, all the various ways that it gets done. You have so much experience in it. What's kind of the sketch of this? What is the way to say to somebody, you can't just try to use other people's jokes. You can't do X. Where, where do you kind of ground zero them? Where do you, where do you level set them? I think the ground zero is I honestly believe um, because I, I teach comedy now online, but I was teaching comedy at Second City. You know, we would be for seven weeks, we would be doing stand up comedy in a classroom. And God bless Second City because they would say to you, This is what we want you to teach. You 
do your curriculum. You do you. So that was really freeing. And I just found that the common denominator is that, um, and as you know, any any you know business person will tell you that everybody has a story. So how do you make your story interesting? So I tell them as soon as they come into the class, and there's people from all walks of life. Uh, you know, there's there's lawyers, there's doctors, real estate agents, um, um, teachers. They come in, social social workers, they come into the class saying, look, I'm doing a lot more presentations now. I want to grab people's attention. I am afraid that I'm boring and I'm putting people to sleep. I'm like, okay, all right, take out the stand-up comedy. Just forget that you're doing stand-up. Let's get out of that left logical brain and let's go to your right, bright creative side. Everybody can tell a story. And then over the seven weeks, I teach them how to tell the story. But here's the difference between a comedian and a storyteller. We get the stories out. We get, because everybody loves to talk about themselves. So this is one time we get you to, we get people to, we encourage them to talk about themselves. We're not like, shut up, we're bored. We just like talk about yourselves. But then we structure it in a way to get it nice and tight. And then we put the backdrop of stand-up comedy behind that that structure. Nobody knows that it's been done. It's magical. It's like when you watch a film and you get blown away by a film. You go, how did they do it? But there is a structure. There is a format to filmmaking. There is a structure. There is a format to stand-up comedy. And sometimes the most boring people can actually be the funniest people. I had a guy who was an accountant and uh, he was pretty He was pretty dull. Well, from the beginning of the class where he was dull, I ended up using him as the headliner for our showcase because the thing is about accountants, the thing is about a lot of uh, very sort of uh, in the box business people is that they do the homework. And that's all I ask. I go, look, it's co comedy, but you still have to do the homework. He always brought his notes in totally typed. And I was like, wow. And it was just so cool to see somebody who could tell stories. But accountants also have that dark sense of humor that I talked about. And it's a way of grabbing that dark sense of humor and using it as a superpower, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think storytelling is really important it's part of our caveman brain again to tell a story. So we take the story, but the difference between the storytelling and the stand-up comedy is, is, is that tiny bit of structure that we're able to put on, on the back, but it, it makes a huge difference. It's so overwhelming to see people do five minutes of stand-up that they thought they could never do seven weeks before. Any situations where you're like, maybe not humor for you, like an undertaker <laughs> going on their stand up. You're like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Not. Well, it's interesting that you ask that, Carrie, because the majority of people that take the class, I would say 95% of them don't want to do stand up comedy, but they want to be better at their presentations at the bank. They want to be better at. Um, you know, they, they've got a wedding coming up and they're the best man or the best woman and they have to do 20 minutes of material, right? Um, but what's interesting, there have been uh, there have been taboo topics. So I always always say to my students, the one of the major golden rules of stand-up comedy is you can punch up. You can punch the establishment, you can punch the rich, you can punch somebody that has something that you don't have. But as soon as you start to punch down, you start to pick on people, people who have you know less money, people who are, are, are going through a bad time, not cool. And as soon as you punch down, you look like a bully. So when you punch up, you are usually, usually safe. Um, and yeah, there's sometimes people who are, are um, you know, are classroom bullies, but that gets adjusted in class. You'd be surprised how quickly the students are to jump on them. Uh, and if the students don't jump on them, of course I jump on them. I say, look, these are the rules of comedy. And I haven't had to kick anybody out, but there have been times where, uh, you know, the, the students adjusted it and I adjusted it and they were fine. And I had one guy that was like that. I'm like, he came from, uh, he came from a country where he was in a gang. So he had no compass in terms of, I don't know why he was taking stand up comedy to be totally honest, but what came out of his mouth in that first set that he did was, was horrifying. 
And believe it or not, he ended up on the showcase and it was clean. It was tight. It was not offensive. And that was one of those moments you go, wow, okay. He's not, he's never going to be a stand up comic, but you know what? He might be a better person. You know, I could punch up all I want, but the show's going to end sometime and I'll have to deal with Chris after. So. <laughs> <laughs> Weird dad says Bob Newhart was an accountant. Yes. Bob Newhart was an accountant. And I'm sure all that fantastic show prep was, was because of his fantastic accounting skills. <laughs> Those debits and credits, man. Material is endless. Totally. You never know where you're going to get it though. You never know where, you know, from whence, uh, you know, there's no particular, even the trope about all uh, uh, comedians being basically seriously depressed people uh, isn't exactly always true. I mean, there's plenty of people who are quite cheery. Uh, Mindy Kaling says all the time, I had a great upbringing, love yeah. my family, you know. Hey, Leno said the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Leno, Leno, who uh, went to the very end of his career, perpetually afraid that he was going to run out of money and just endlessly thought, I'm never going to make it. Stop buying cars, dumbass. <laughs> Literally all you had to do. You're worried about money. <laughs> um, to that end, and you, you said, you know, you've done some teaching at uh, Second City back when the world was uh, open and you can actually walk around in places and stuff sure. like that. Second City's legendary for comedy and uh, just some of the some of the big greats. And it was like an early feeding uh, ground for places like SNL. Um with comedy, like you said, not everybody's going to do it on a stage. No one, not everyone's going to work on their type five, so to speak. But what they can learn from that uh, translates to so many more places. Do you love that moment where you see that spark, that that moment of when I'm realizing I don't have to be on an open mic night to get this done? And and how are some of the other ways you help people translate that? Well, the thing that I say to my students is there is enough negativity out there in you know, when we were doing the clubs, but when we get back to clubs and there's live performances now for sure, but I mean, it's behind plexiglass. Uh, it's crazy, right? But eventually we will get back to the normal, uh, the normal way of, of doing stand up. But um, it, 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 it just takes time, right? But it is really, really great to see people get it. And it usually happens about the third or fourth class in um, that the, the light bulb goes off and they, they get that magical structure behind the story. Uh, cause stories are boring, you know, like I know we all like to talk about ourselves, but stories are boring without a tiny bit of structure behind. And when they get it, that is really cool. And then the, the final presentation, the final five minutes, that's, it's, it's great. And, you know, they invite their, their friends and their family and, uh, their, their workmates. And it's so cool to see them. It's almost sad in a way because you're going, oh, okay, grasshopper, you know, goodbye. It was nice, blah, blah, blah. And you've had this close relationship for for seven weeks where you've literally had to hold people's hands. And then you see them go into their groups, you know, you see them go back to their family or their uh their their their, their friends and they leave and everyone's patting them on the back and they've got these giant smiles. It's a really magical moment. And that's really neat to see. So at the first, the first moment when you see them get it and they're getting consistent laughs in the classroom. And then when they're getting those consistent laughs in front of a live audience, that's really special. I love, I love seeing that. So Judy, you teach, you keynote, you also do a whole kinds of, you know, work with uh, nonprofits and whatnot. So one of the biggest ones that you're working on right now is city street outreach. And so you're doing a lot of work there, which is helping with uh, people who are not currently homed and helping with things like, you know, doing uh, COVID uh, watches and making sure that food, clothing and everything else goes to homeless and street youth. Uh, these kinds of projects are tricky and they take a lot of time and effort. But of course, we all think that's what we're supposed to do. How did you pick this and, and what made you, you know, decide to team up with City uh, Street Outreach as one of your projects? Uh, well, and it's funny that City Street Outreach has kind of come back, um, you know, into my life because like everybody else going through COVID was extremely, is extremely stressful and, um, you know, kind of going into the grip going, what's going to happen now? Uh, I feel blessed that my, my presentations, my, my classes, my keynotes have gone online, but there's a lot of people who aren't so lucky. So uh, because everything went virtually, for me, I had a lot more time on my hands. 
And I went, great, I can donate some more time to City Street Outreach. And basically, uh, my involvement with City Street Outreach was with, um, I, I had actually done an interview, a radio interview with a gentleman by the name of Alex Smyrnas and his wife, Grace. Two fantastic people. Alex had a dream the night before that he was handing out coffee and blankets and sandwiches to the homeless people of Toronto. And so he got in his car that week and started handing out sandwiches and coffee and blankets. And he and his wife did this on their own for the first couple of years. It uh, remains, I, I want to say it's been around now for about seven or eight years, 100% volunteers. But now uh, Alex has put his own money into uh, buying trucks and we are um, able to get food that is, you know, maybe uh, a week away from its expiration date or whatever. There's so many desperate people for food, for clothing, for bank blankets. It's turned into this giant organization. And uh, again, 100% volunteers. And it was because of my interview with, with Alex. And as we are facing more homeless people, or we are, as we are facing more needy people, for me, that was just a way of getting out of the grip. Have a a purpose, have a mission, have give something back because there are times you're going to feel vulnerable. There are times there's so many people that are volunteering with City Street Outreach that have either been homeless uh, or have been close to being homeless. And the first thing they do is they they give back. They're the ones on the trucks giving the sandwiches, the coffee, the food. And, and I'm constantly reminded uh, the power of humor, even then in those really dire situations, you know, you give coffee or a blanket to someone that's sitting on the streets and they start to crack jokes. They start to do a routine about you, you know, <laughs> and they're laughing and you think, oh my God, this person's got nothing. And they're still finding, they're finding the humor in the situation. So that's how I got involved with City Street Outreach. And um, I encourage anybody to, uh, if you're feeling like, you know, you just can't take this anymore, you're feeling like what else can happen? Number one, don't ask that because a lot of other stuff can happen. But try to do something for somebody else. Find the purpose, find the mission, because uh, companies that have that purpose, that mission, hold on to their employees much longer. And individuals who have that purpose, that mission, that meaning, tend to be statistically healthier. So uh, I'm, I'm just really, really grateful that Alex and Grace came into my life because they've changed it. They've, they've made me a better person. One of our previous guests, Mark Horvath, came on the show and he he runs Invisible People now making videos where homeless people tell their stories. So you get to see, you know, the people and not, you know, view them differently. You see For them sure. as humans. It's really something amazing. Right well, it's funny, yeah, it's funny that you say that because, um, you know, a, a lot of our 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 friends a lot of our street friends say look i know sometimes people don't have money i know they don't have anything to give me but just give me a smile just just meet me uh, you know just give me some eye contact so that i'm not invisible it's very important in the past you've also done some work with sistering.org i found that on your mm -hmm. website and i thought that was interesting so that's that's speaking out to uh specifically a lot of uh Canada's uh, Toronto's trans women mm -hmm. and uh, the trans community in general is, you know, trouble, especially where they may or may not be uh, homeless or precariously housed. So that's more than one charity uh, or, or outreach or nonprofit where yeah. you have the opera. I never, never like the word charity uh, where you have the opportunity to work with people in that kind of environment. Interesting that this one specific for trans people who are mm -hmm. uh, unhoused at a much higher number than their cisgendered uh, friends. How, how did that process work? And are you still doing some work with them or is that behind now no i'm uh, still whenever um you know alex has for example an organization gives a bunch of uh gives us clothing or or gives us food sistering is one of the group, groups that we reach out to they have a kitchen they're very very organized some of the uh celebrity chefs in canada uh did a big fundraiser for them a couple of years ago pre-covid and they were able to build uh build their own sort of tv kitchen so they crank out a lot of their own meals but um with sistering um pre-covid again but uh what was really fantastic the, i think one of the gifts that stand-up comedy has given me aside from yeah entertaining and coaching and and doing keynotes, whatever. But one of the gifts is that it was a really easy way 
of doing a fundraiser. So Sistering was one of those organizations. Uh, we didn't have a club at the time because, you know, uh, it was expensive to get a club. We wanted to give all the money to Sistering. So I got some female comics together and we went to one of my friend's condos. She put up posters. We did a, uh, a condo fundraiser, raised all the money. It went to Sistering. And, um, and then on a larger scale, uh, I was very lucky. I was very blessed when I was doing radio in Toronto. Again, uh, I said, you know, it'd be great to do one night a year, all female comics. And we used the radio station to promote it. And what ended up happening is we got together with uh, Princess Margaret Hospital and the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation. And over six years, we raised over $650,000 for breast cancer research. So you know what, whatever it is you do in life, whatever your business is, whatever your quirk is, that's your gift. Figure out how you can use it to uh, to give back because that that is your superpower. And I'm I'm fortunate that humor has been my superpower. It's worked out in so many different ways. And you're right to do it where you can. We're going to grab Everett back as well, Everett Cruz, and we're going to talk to him as well. Everett, welcome back. The uh, notion of being able to give where you can and all that, I mean, that's one of the things you do with tennis, of course, is it's for the yeah. love of the game. And there's a lot of people who maybe otherwise don't get as entertained. What did you think when you were hearing some of this? And also, I don't know, is there a future for you as a comedian, Everett? Yeah, of course. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but I, keep, I only keep that hair at home. <laughs> it's just bad thinking. jokes. That's all you, you can do. There. <laughs> no, I make bad jokes out of the people I teach or when I'm showing them what they look like. And no, no, it's, um, <laughs> it's, really good. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling to, um, I say the biggest um, award I ever got is when you have people coming into tennis and we had people, I mean, I had kids that the parents says, you know, he, he has a disorder, he have ADHD or um, elderly people that, you know, can have part of the body that's, you know, handicapped and they have not been able to do this because of, of their situation and the circumstances. And you can actually take that person and, if you, I call it um, positive reinforcements over and over and over again to someone believe in themselves and encourage them. And then, you know, years goes by. And then I have the person standing there in the tennis court three years later, and we keeping a good solid rally back and forth. And they say, ever in my life did I ever think I would be able to do this, but I am doing it right now. And that's like kind of philo the whole philosophy behind my tennis academy is, Yes, I mean, you always get those kids or even adults in there, you know, they played before, they've done this for years and years before, and they need to fine tune. But you also get those people in that's never done this and never thought they can do it. And I think with the right direction and the right coaching, they succeed and they, um, you know, years later. And it's such a pleasure, like five or 10 years later, I can actually see that person go onto the tennis courts and play with a friend and say, oh, this is what I do now, and um, and thanks to something I started ten years ago. And hi, Deanna, see you out the door. And by the way, hi, Nancy. That's an unbelievable in. feeling to see. <laughs> it's a big one. Yeah. It's a big one. Um, as you were hearing about this, Judy, and you were looking at that clothing brand, you know, Everett's launching this thing in California, where we can all imagine is not necessarily you know heavy winter jacket land, but you know maybe. <laughs> Maybe if Tencent Canada wants to launch, maybe you could run that company for him. For sure. I, I'm all over it. That's really cool. Uh, really cool clothing, Everett. I'm very, uh, very happy to see that. Love it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a lot going on and there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, the uh, other thing I was thinking about when I was listening to both of you is just how your your job in guiding people to see who they are and to accept who they are and be where they are. Is part of that helping them understand where where they aren't? I mean, is it that you have to kind of help people understand some of their preconceived or false notions of themselves? And how do you take that away? Judy, how do you, how do you take away gently uh, some of the crutches <laughs> that we build in our world? Uh, I think you hit the nail on the head earlier. You know, don't do other people's material. First of all, uh, you're gonna get you're gonna get nailed by somebody for for saying, "Hey, you're using so and so's line." Number one, uh, but number two, <coughs> Amy Schumer, <coughs> so just be yourself. <laughs> just be yourself. 
what is your story? Everybody has a story to tell. Add a little bit of structure with that and you're golden. So that's, I would say that's my main takeaway. Just be yourself, your trust, trust your weirdness. It's, it's your superpower. Yeah. Apropos of nothing, I just want to say that last night I was watching an, like a 1963 clip of George uh, um, Carlin and I was watching George Carlin sort of proto George Carlin. It's not the one that we're used to from the 70s and 80s. That That's very iconic special that we all saw with the seven major swear words and all that. Right. It was fascinating because he was on the Merv Griffin show. So of course he already has to do it appropriate for television. But just to hear his early days and to understand like how much further he learned to take things, even if he had to, to work clean and not blue. Uh, it's I think everyone's life is like that. I wonder if there's a similar thing in tennis, Everett, where you know you have to teach people to kind of go big on whatever their strength is and their style, or do you make them have to conform? Is is tennis about conformity or finding your spot? Uh, I think maybe something right in between, where. I, you know, everyone, it's a, each individual and they all, how to say, um, what triggers them or what clicks them to, if it is to learn or, or to understand or you find their, you find their way. And I think that's maybe probably the biggest challenge you have as a, as a tennis coach standing on the court that every person that walks in is so different. They, their background and where they come from. And, I mean, we always say like this, one of the toughest people to teach is um, a doctor or, or a lawyer. They're very smart. They're very quick thinking. And, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm sorry. And I'm terrible <laughs> at tennis. You know everything. So when you stand in there and trying to show them, he's like, yeah, I, I, I got this. I got this. I got this. Come on. Let's move on. Let's move on. And and you you feel like, oh, this, this is going to take a while. Compare that to um, how we say sometimes when we teach kids, they're so open-minded, they're so willing to learn. You tell them one thing one time, they said, I got it. And then all they do is just repeat and then you call it, well, it's easy. So um, that's an interesting part to just find what works for each person. And um, yeah. <laughs> Polish that right up. Yeah. Well, we've hit some different parts of our show and it's time for person of the day. Oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom. And then what we do is we just look around through the comment section. We go find something that we think is interesting. And we bring it up. I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for person today. I had something in mind and then I changed my mind last minute because I can do that. Uh, I'm just going to give my dad this. There's nepotism allowed. Bob Newhart was <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love all the iterations of the Bob Newhart show. Oh, and I loved his I'm more broken. recent podcast appearances. He's done some great work in his elder years, as one might say. Person of the day gets you a free apple. You just have to go and purchase it and then wash it before eating. <laughs> wear, wear your masks, Dad. Okay, listen, last thing we're going to do is what goes in your backpack. This is a question that we ask every guest, which is what over the next five years can you throw in the backpack, either physical or metaphorical, that's going to help people grow? It can be anything. Uh, some of our past favorites might be I don't know, Carrie. What do you got? What's something good and physical that you could throw in there? An extra set of teeth. An extra <laughs> set of teeth. DJ <laughs> Cummerbund said that. We all just went, huh? He goes, you never know when you're going to need another set of teeth. <laughs> okay. Uh, my favorite is an avocado. Uh, metaphorical. Uh, some of the best ones. Carrie has the better ones for that. So, who are some of your favorites? Fearlessness and vulnerability. Dave Landau. <laughs> Comedian Dave Landau. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I, I always like anybody who says some variation of uh, curiosity or whatnot. So that's a good one. So I'll start with you, Everett Cruz. What goes in the backpack? Uh, that's a good uh, energy. Okay. I need more energy for the kids to keep everything spinning around every day and having the kids at home and trying to be a parent and same time try to do the business and at the same time be on the courts and to make everything work. I, I feel like I always need more energy and um, wish there was more days in the week, but um, no, but just staying strong and positive and healthy. I think it's um, what I want to keep in there. And you had to get up before 7 a.m. to do this show. So you're going to need extra energy. And yeah. the, the, the trick was how to try to get out of the bed without the kids hearing me. <laughs> that took a couple of times. You got to sort of slide out. <laughs> yeah. You can't just um, get up and get out. That makes everything better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Judy Kroon, in between doing all of your virtual coaching and services, everything we can do at a distance now, yeah. what are you going to add to our backpack? Uh, I would say, you know, uh, what works in my backpack, and I just take a, a you know, sort of a, the pillars that work for me that I do with my my keynote, relieving stress with humor, positive attitude, uh, as Everett was saying, positive attitude includes humor. That's number one on my list. Um, number two, perseverance. Uh, number three, forgiveness. I think during COVID especially, we are, everyone's got frayed nerves, but we also don't forgive ourselves enough. It's like, oh, why aren't I getting this technology? Why, why aren't I, uh, you know, why aren't things working out? I'm, why aren't I handling this better? So forgiveness is big because when we choose not to forgive, we are firing off our stress hormones and so literally cooking on our own chemicals. So forgiveness is big. Uh, with forgiveness, I say faith. Um, and that doesn't have to be spiritual, but it doesn't have to be religious. It just means, like I said, having some meaning, having some purpose, giving something back. You know, what is your, your legacy going to be? What is that blueprint that you're gonna hand off to the next generation to make things better? Uh, healthy mental activity. Uh, healthy mental activity as we move from this information era to uh, uh, to a, um, a conceptual era. It's not getting our fingers on all of the information. Uh, you know, information has become so cheap and accessible, but it's improving our critical thinking. And the best way to do that is to keep our right, bright, creative side open. Um, and finally, family and friends and healthy physical activity. And if you can't remember all of that, I would. I know that, uh, Carrie, you're in Nashville, so I would like to lean on Reba McIntyre for a, a great quote. She said, all you need in life is a backbone, a funny bone, and a wishbone. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Good call. Good call. So go to judycroon.com. You can see that list right on the front page, by the way. So you just scroll down just a little bit. It's right there. You, you don't have it. to remember it. <laughs> yeah. So normally I tell a grandmother story. I'm going to tell a grandfather story. My grandfather took me out to play tennis in the Augusta Maine tennis courts, the public municipal courts. And I used the 1970s era because it was the 70s wooden racket. It weighed more than me. Uh, I didn't know there was a front or a back of the racket. I knew that I could somehow do backhand better than forehand, which I don't think is a good thing because then I spent most of the day trying to turn around to make it mm -hmm. a backhand shot, even when it wasn't, which is the worst. Uh, and I can tell you at the very end of it all, um, I had only ever twice in my life, this is my beloved grandfather uh, on my dad's side. I had only ever seen that man <laughs> exasperated twice in life. And once was during a, a, a automobile uh, thing he had to handle. And the other was when I was playing tennis, when those hands went up. And then <laughs> next, you know, I'll tell you what he told me.